Thank you. Good morning, guys. I hope you guys are having a great conference so far. Is it working, the mic? Yeah. Ah, okay, cool. And uh, today I'm here to talk about functional stream processing with Scala, and I'll be using Scala Z stream mainly to do that. A bit about me, my name is Adil, and I'm a Scala enthusiast interested in functional programming. I'm coming from Netherlands. I work there as a software architect in a company called Ordina, which is a Dutch software consultancy company. Uh, so I have lots of slides to cover today, and therefore I'll go really fast. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so in the next 45 minutes, uh, we'll see how Scala Z stream works, and how it can facilitate functional stream processing with Scala. And therefore, we'll look into its primary goals, its design philosophy, its core building blocks, and its semantics. Expectation from this presentation would be to, uh, to, to uh, get an introduction to Scala Z stream. And uh, the idea is to motivate you so that you can use it afterward. Uh, so if you're really expert with uh, Scala stream, a lot of things will be a reputation uh, for you. So the idea is that I'll be only focusing on the good part of Scala stream, not covering the, the bad part of it, so that you can be motivated and use it after this presentation. So let's get started. Uh, what is Scala stream? Scala stream is a functional stream processing library. It provides functional abstraction over a stream of data. And therefore, you can define your stream in a referentially transparent way. The stream are, uh, in essence, immutable. The core tenant of Scala stream that it allows you to delay and isolate your side effect until your whole stream is composed and assembled in the final execution context. It actually assimilated concept from other functional stream processing libraries like Haskell Machine. So in this talk, we'll be focusing on the 0.8 version of ScalaZ. Uh, one note that it has been changing really fast. The new version uh, would be called FS2, which means functional stream for Scala. But this library is really a lightweight library. It's quite self-contained. Uh, and it has only one dependency, as the name implies, ScalaZ. So I, I guess you all know about ScalaZ. It's a library for doing functional programming. Uh, it provides uh, several type classes and functional construct uh, to make functional programming uh, quite easy. I'm not going to cover much about ScalaZ today. But just to keep the talk self-contained, I, I would like to cover at least two concepts from this framework. The first one, the backslash and forward slash thing, is called a Scala Z disjunction. Uh, the disjunction, you can, you can think of it as either of Scala, uh, but it's a bit better because it's right biased. So you can use or encode uh, your types with, uh, with this disjunction, like, like, uh, like the example shown in the screen where response is basically error disjunction string. So it can be, if, it, if there is an error, then uh, it can be an error, or in the success case, it, case it, it could be a string as well. So it can be used in a fault comprehension in a much more monadic way, because it's right biased. So that's uh, ScalaZ disjunction. Next, uh, we'll talk about uh, task from ScalaZ. A task is a purely functional structure, it can declaratively specify a sequence of instruction to be executed. So in essence, it actually creates a monadic context for performing asynchronous computation. You can think of it as a better future, which has some notion of error handling. But uh, the one key distinction with the Scala future is that it actually separates what to do from when to do it. Just to give you an example, so let's say that we have to design a missile launching system today here, but we're not going to launch that missile now, but we'll be launching it in future. So that's our effectful function. If you call that function, it simply launch a missile. So if I have to lead that computation in a Scala future, then as soon as I define that uh, launch future, it will actually launch the, uh, launch the missile immediately. So it is evaluated quite eagerly, which we really don't want to launch it now during the conference, right? <laughs> so, but there is no way you can, uh, you can model it like that because Scala, uh, Scala Future is quite eager with respect to that. 
If you call it second time, nothing happens. Why? Because of side effect memoization of feature. But now we'll do the same thing with task. Task allow to leave the computation uh, in a simulating context. So when you define a task, nothing happens. So when you define launch task, still the missile is there, not being executed or launched. When you call run on it, only then it will launch the missile for you. And what happens if you, if you actually invoke run one more time? It will launch as the second missile for you. So in that way, it's quite deterministic, and it's lazy, and purely functional and compositional. So you can actually uh, think of it as a first class construct, which you can uh, modify as a value. It, it is easily that you can combine features, uh, sorry, combine task because task is a monad, and you can move around task from thread pools. Note that uh, it's also a trampoline construct, if you know what that is, but if you don't know what is trampoline construct, that's also fine. <coughs> yeah. So there are different combinators that's, that has been provided in the library uh, to construct a task. Uh, there are a few, you can, you can take a look at the uh, Scala doc uh, of, uh, of tasks to see how you can quite easily leave to your computation uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a monody context. To give you a really simple example, so what we're going to do, we are going to query a Twitter source, and based on, uh, based on the query object, it will just give us a list of status. So let's, let's use Twitter for JS, a Java library, and, and that's okay, so we'll be, We'll be, use, we'll be creating a Twitter client with that. And then, we, using the Twitter client, we can search Twitter with the given query and get the tweets that matching the query and returning that as a list. So note that we have listed that whole computation inside a task now. So nothing happens at that point. If you would like to get the status, you have to explicitly invoke run on it. So in that manner, in that way, it's quite deterministic. Uh, if you want to do uh, non-deterministic computation, you have to explicitly tell it to do it. But by default, it's deterministic. So that, th those were like prerequisite constructs that has been used by Scala Z stream. So we are moving back to Scala Z stream now. Scala Z stream, the primary objective of it is to support purely functional incremental I.O. and stream processing uh, in a modular and reusable way. So the idea is that, that you would define uh, your stream processing pipeline, the individual comp component, uh, in a separately in a modular way, and you can compose them together to, uh, to, just to build your stream processing pipeline. There has been qu quite some uh, uh, focus on resource safety. Uh, let's say that you would, you would like to communicate with a file handle or you would like to communicate with a network socket. So when it, it actually combines your stream processing pipeline, while executing it also ensures that it actually closes those uh, file handler or network socket by default if there's something going wrong with the stream processing. Uh, obviously there has been a focus on performance but the new version if it's to, uh, I think it will be much better in terms of performance. So in this talk we'll be only focusing on the modularity and compositionality part of the, of the framework. We'll see that how we can define individual component of a stream processing pipeline uh, in a modular way, and then compose them together, and in then in 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 compose them together, and then materialize it and run it. So, in order to uh, show you the rest of the examples that I have, I would like to import the following uh, from uh, from the libraries, so from ScalaZ and ScalaZ stream. Uh, to give, give you an example that how a Scala Z stream uh, processing pipeline would look like, so let's do some file I.O. With, uh, with this framework. So we have a function that takes a, takes a Fahrenheit and convert it to Celsius. That's a simple function. Now we have a really big file where each line contains uh, Fahrenheit temperatures, and our boss wants us to translate that to a Celsius equivalent. So the, how would you do it? You, you would read the file, 
you would do some uh, processing on it and then you would write it in a different file. That's how you would usually do it. With Scala Z Stream, this is how it looks like. So we are using the I.O. package from Scala Z Stream. The line R is actually reading each line from the Fahrenheit.exe file. Then we are filtering on those lines. Those are empty or start with a double slash. Then we are actually converting the string value of Fahrenheit to its uh, Celsius counterpart. And now that we have a list of Celsius values, we actually interpret it with uh, new lines, encode it with ETF-8, and running it to a different file. The interesting thing to point out here is that there is no way you are opening the file or closing the file handlers and that sort of things. So like I mentioned that uh, Scala's stream uh, focuses on resource safety uh, as its primary objective, and therefore it by default um, handles closing the file handlers for you. So if something goes wrong while processing this pipeline, it will call the finalizer and close the resource for you. So the value as there is just a description of the stream. In order to run it, you need to call run. That's actually compiles this whole stream to a task, the task construct that we have we have seen earlier. And then if we run that task, is then actually then it's running this whole thing and creating that Celsius.txt file for you. Another important thing to note here is that a stream uh, is represented by process, which is basically how a Scala stream is represented. And uh, we'll be focusing on what process is in the next slides. Uh, um, before that, we'd like to cover the design philosophy of Scala uh, stream. Uh, the, the core design principle of this framework is to model asynchronous computation as core data which implies the existence of infinite list, structural recursion, and open-ended loops. But it also guarantees non-existence of any bad behavior. So that's cool. You got a lot of things for free. Uh, it's actually giving you the guarantee that there will not be any problem with your recursion or with your infinite list. So how does what kind of data structure it uses to model the stream? It actually is a recursive data structure uh, by which it models infinite or finite list of uh, finite stream. But uh, to, to simplify this data structure, you can think of it as a lazy list where each of the element is either a data or an effect. I'm going to explain more what does that imply. But in essence, Scala stream actually provides you an abstraction to declaratively specify how to obtain a list of, or, or sorry, a stream of value or data. In order to provide the, that abstraction, it actually based on uh, algebra. Uh, the core of that algebra is this process. So you can think of it as the abstraction that Scala Z stream use to construct all different kind of component like source, sync, all different kind of thing is model as process. So what does this mean? It actually describes a sequence of computation to generate stream of data. If you take a look at this uh, signature, it actually takes two type parameter, F and O, and it's actually a trait in the library. So now if we take a close look uh, in the definition of process, the O actually represents stream of values. So basically that's the output time. So if you define uh, a stream, that's the value that you'll be getting from, from it. And F is a monadic context. It doesn't have to be monadic, but uh, if, if you want to run it, then it has to be a uh, monadic context. Uh, but uh, what it will do, it will actually do some side effect. So a process actually presents an interesting construct here that it actually can interleave between uh, emission of an object and also performing side effects. So in essence, SCSI stream makes side effect as a first class construct in the library. So one important thing to note here is that uh, the F here doesn't have any input type parameter, so it can be anything. So if you think of it as a task, like we defined earlier, 
So this task doesn't have any input parameter. So the side effect is on the input parameter, not on the output. And the side effect could be anything. It could be reading from the network socket, or it could be reading from the file. But as soon as it's emitting a value of type O, well, we are, we are type safe. So a process algebra, the, the halt and emit, these, these two are the simplest form of process. And uh, what does that mean? Uh, halt means an empty process or empty stream. So you can think of it as list.empty. So if you, if you think of a list data structure from Scala. And um, a, whole, a process can be an, at a halt uh, state uh, in a normal way or in an abnormal way. The, the parameter cost there actually can tell you that whether it has been an abnormal termination or it just reached the end of the stream. Note that, that uh, this does not uh, do any side effects. So the type of halt is process nothing, nothing. So next form of process is emit. It actually emits a sequence or, or chunk of values. If you take a look at it, its, it's structure is quite similar to this. It has a head, which actually represents the type of value to be emitted in the, this state. And then it has also tail, which actually uh, refers to the next state to be processed. By emit, it actually represents pure stream. So basically, it will just represent the values out of it. It could be integer, it can be a string, something like that. But it, do, it also doesn't have any side effect. So the type of this kind of process is process of nothing. And O. So just to give an example of a PO stream, um, we, we, have, we, we just import process dot underscore, and we can emit a string value or we can emit a sequence of value using emit. So, so far we have defined how you can uh, emit uh, string values or how you can build an empty stream or empty process. Uh, in the next part, we'll be looking into how you can do side effects. So abstracting and controlling the existence of effect is the central design principle of Scala Z stream. Um, the way it does that with this form of process, await. So await is just another form of process that encodes effectful stream in Scala stream. The process expect the result of request to process the next step with receive. So you can think of it like the diagram above when you are executing your process. As soon as it gets to await, then it actually uh, do some side effect and waiting for the side effect to finish. And then when it gets a result, it continue with the rest of the stream processing. Another important part of this construct uh, is the fact that this is the first time where uh, uh, we have the type parameter i there, uh, which is local to await. So at each await state, you can actually specify uh, what, kind of, what kind of input type, what kind of side effect you'd like to perform. So the f of i could be reading from a file, uh, file handler or reading from a network socket. It can query Twitter or it can query Facebook. So it's actually local to our, so which, is, which is quite interesting. So at different steps, the i can be completely different. To give you an example of if we pull the string, the, we'll, we can use the previous example that we had. So basically, uh, previously, what we did, we had a query and we were building a task of list of status from uh, searching Twitter with the Twitter client. We can lead that uh, task into await, so we can pass that in await, and await will wait to finish up the query task. And when it gets the result, then it will emit the resultant values out of it. So in essence, it built a very simple process, which has three steps await, and then it awaits from the result. Then when the result comes back, it will continue with emit and hold, and then holds. So with, with that kind of process, uh, you can actually uh, start searching with hash code Spark or hash code Scala node, and it would just go search a Twitter source uh, with the Twitter stream and then give you the result back. To give you another example, we'll, we'll build an infinite list of stream. 
and the way I will build it will emit a value and then we'll be recursively calling the next uh, uh, the next method next function there which is basically another process of task of int so basically it will recursively so it start with one then it will recursively call the next fun next again with two three so in essence it will build an infinite stream of integers so just to wrap up for um, process uh, the most interesting fact about process is that it has one special power that it can interleave emission of values with execution of side effects so a sequence of O is emitted and interleaved those emissions with the evolution of those of F of something. So the F of something can be anything there. But as long as your output type is O, uh, you're fine and you, you, you're building your stream in a really type safe manner. So interestingly, uh, we can see that a process can be uh, think of, uh, we can think of process as a state machine, which actually traverse from emit to await to emit and then at some point it will hold. So you can think of it again uh, as a free monad, uh, if you know what that is, but uh, for this talk it's not that important. But the, uh, the idea is that, that it, it actually represents uh, the whole recursive data structure in your heap space instead of your stack. There are several combinators are there in the library that can uh, that can help you to construct process. You can also take a look at it uh, in the Scala doc. But uh, just to give you an idea, the eval is lifting any uh, effectful computation like task or something uh, into a process. And repeat eval is similar to eval, but it will repeatedly execute that side effect for you and start emitting values from it. So we have, we have seen that how the process algebra works and how you can use it to define your processes or string. Now it gets to the point where we would like to run the stream. So as, as we discussed before, the stream is just a description. Uh, the library provides you a compiler that compiles the description to an effect type called task, and then you can run it. So in essence, it needs to know an, an environment where the stream will be executed. So it, the process has this run method. The run convert the process into a single monolithic thing. Uh, the thing here is f, which can be a task as well. And the process dot run implies one constraint that f has to be a monad there uh, to accum accumulate all the effects. So to give you an example, we had a infinite integer stream defined earlier, and if, if we take 10 of them and start running it, then uh, then it, first thing that it does, it compiles the whole integer stream uh, to a task, and then when you run the task, it, it do some side effects. But in this case, it's just emitting values and not doing any side effect because our stream is, is a pure stream. But if you'd like to see that what other values emitted in each step, we can use a different combinator called runlog. And with runlog, it actually preserves the value emitted for, from each of the emit state. Uh, to get back to the previous example, if we use the runlog instead of run, then you can see the first 10 uh, values from the integer stream as output there. But if you run it in the actual integer stream, then it will run forever because it will try to accumulate all the values from the infinite integer stream. And at one point in time, you will be out of your heap memory space and then it will stop. So the idea is not to use it in production. It's just use, it meant for doing some small debugging. There are other combinators like run last and run full map that, uh, that we can use in some, sort of some cases as well. Uh, run last will only preserve the last emitted values, and run full map uh, is basically transform the type of A to type of B and add them up together. So basically, it maps the output B and add them up, and the B here has to be uh, monoid B, so that you can add them up together. So these are the few combinators that you can use to run your process. So we, we have seen so far that how you can how you can build your process of uh, small streams and how you can run them. Uh, but we can do a lot of different kind of transformation on the process. Since process is a monad, we can do map or flat map there. 
we can also zip two processes together and uh, yeah we can we can zip it and then uh, you have a process of tuple in string there so now we are getting into more interesting part we, we so far we have defined one process and simply run it but now we'll try to define a process and other kind of abstractions for a stream processing pipeline and we'll see how to combine them together. So the first construct that we have is a transducer that actually transforms process that emits I to a process that emits O. In essence, it's simply a type, uh, it's simply a type alias of process. Uh, yeah, but it has uh, interesting uh, type lambda there, which I'm not going to explain. But the idea is that, that this kind of process is just uh, ensure that I is requested from your source. So given a process, you can pipe it to a transducer. So here we are transforming a stream of A to a stream of B by using the transdu tra transducer there, which is processed from A to B. You can define different kind of transducer uh, independently. For in instance, in this example, uh, we, we had the integer stream. We would like to filter uh, only the values that is greater than five. So you had a stream of integer, then now you get a new in stream of integer where the values are greater than five. And then you'd like to also check that if the value of 10 is there. Uh, so then you from a stream of integer, you just got a stream of Boolean there, which might only contain one value. But this way, you can compose different transdu transducer together. And uh, yeah, it uh, works great. The next abstraction that we have is a channel. A channel is an effectful stream that accepts input type i and use it in a monadic effect f to produce potential o's. So basically, it's again, uses type, uh, sorry, uses process abstraction, and it repeatedly emit a function from i to f of o. And uh, when you combine them with a source process, uh, with a channel, then basically uh, with, with this throw combinator, so it takes a value from the process and it emits the function and apply the function to the value and then emit the resultant value in the, in the, in the, in the stream. To give you an example, let's uh, define a multiply by 10 channel. It's a really simple example. So we had the, this channel, it takes an integer and then it multiplies it by 10. Uh, really simple. So it basically accepts the integer and multiplies it by 10 and emit it to the output stream. So given we had that integer stream before, we just take the five of it so that we can use the run log and we pass it through the multiply channel. And if we run it, we'll see that every value of the stream is multiplied by 10. So we had process, transducer, transducer uh, channel, and now the interesting construct is sync. So far we were using runlog, but we don't want to use runlog uh, in the production. We'd like to use a sync that will actually consume the values coming from a source. So this is the construct to do that. Uh, it is a special kind of channel where instead of a fun pure function, it actually emits effectful function. Basically, it, it actually accepts O, uh, a function from O to F of unit. So basically, it consumes the value that's, that's coming from the source. So in essence, it's a stream of effectful function. Uh, given you have a process, you can connect it with, uh, with your sync via this two combinator. And what does it do? It actually, again, similar as through, it actually uh, gets a value from, uh, from your source and gets the function from uh, the sync and apply uh, the function with the value and emit the resultant value, which will be a uh, unit all the time. So basically, that's why the output type is process of task unit there. To give you an example, we will define a log function or log sync. So what does it do? It will grab each value from the stream and just write it down uh, like, uh, like with a printer line. Uh, pretty simple, right? So we had this integer stream. Again, we just take five of it so that it doesn't run forever. And we connect it with the log combinator. Then you can see the output uh, values from, from it, like five, five of the values from the integer stream. And note that this time when we run, we can see some output because we have attached a scene there. Previously, we didn't have 
this thing attached to a process and therefore uh, in the run method we in the previously when we run it we didn't see any side effect but this time we're doing some side effect and printing these values so we have several construct built on process what we'll do we'll combine those construct and we'll build a sentiment analysis pipeline uh, stream processing pipeline for tweets so basically we had source we had transducer and we had sync and also we have channels obviously and what we're going to do we are going to query twitter for a set of tweets and then we'll do some sentiment analysis on it and then we'll, we'll publish it to some sync so uh, to just to get started we have those two uh, kind of process the duration process is awake in every 15 seconds and then we have request process that actually emits a stream of query so it actually emitting the query repeatedly and now when we zip, zip these two uh, process, that basically means that in every 15 uh, seconds, there will be one uh, query emitted from the stream. So that's basically our source in this point. Uh, every 15 seconds is generating one query. And now the example we had previously that actually uh, connect with the Twitter stream and do some query on it, we can leave that computation as a channel which actually takes a query and returns a list of status. So in the stream pipeline, we had the source defined. We connect it through the query channel. So basically, we get a stream of list of status. We do flat map like we saw earlier. And then we get a process of, or a stream of status. And we map it to a stream of tweets. So far, we have now tweets that actually corresponds to query. And we have to do some sentiment analysis on it. And we can use a sentiment analyzer for that. And we have a function that takes a tweet and performs some sentiment analysis on it. And also, it does a retweet uh, count there. So the enriched tweet uh, case class has these two additional property, which uh, represent the sentiment of the tweet and also the retweet count. We leave that whole computation as a channel uh, by channel lift analyze uh, thing there. And we had the previous streaming pipeline there on the screen. Now we can connect it to the analysis channel. So basically, that will transform the tweet from uh, to normal tweet to an uh, enriched tweet, which has now the sentiment analysis. So basically, that's our stream processing pipeline. It's actually getting tweets uh, given the query in every 15 seconds, and then it's performing some uh, analysis on it. If we connect it with the sync that we defined, the log sync, then, uh, and run it, then you can see the output from, uh, from it in your console, where it also shows the sentiment and uh, the retweet count of each of the tweets. But that we can do better, right? So HTTP4S, it's a framework that's also built using uh, uh, Scala's stream. You can connect it to your WebSocket endpoint now. And what you can, uh, what you, it, you can connect this whole stream to your WebSocket endpoint. Then you can see the output in out, output in the, on the screen. That's whenever you are connected to, with your WebSocket. In every 15 seconds, it will come up with a new tweet. But in this example, what we did, we have created our own source. But in uh, normal use cases or real world use cases, you already might have a Twitter stream there that you'd like to use. And that has been built with either archive stream or Twitter4j also has a um, Twitter stream there. How can you connect to uh, running Twitter stream and then do the same thing? In order to do that, uh, uh, Scala's stream has an interesting thing called bounded queue, which is basically non-blocking and bounded as well. Uh, so you can define it, and it, can, it gives you two things. It, it gives you a sync, where you can connect your tweets coming from the live stream to that sync. And also, it gives you a, a producer, or sorry, a, a, a consumer that can read the tweets from the, from the queue. I'll show you how, how that works. So basically, we, we have the sync now and uh, from, the, from the queue. And every time there is a status coming from the Twitter, uh, Twitter stream, it actually pushing it to the sync. Uh, the way we can build producer is that we can start running uh, it asynchronously and uh, connected it with the sync now. And at the consumer side, what we do is exactly the same thing. The queue has, has a process. 
which, uh, which you can use to get a stream of status, and then you can map it to a tweet and then pass it through your uh, enrich, uh, pass it through your analysis channel to get a sentiment and retweet count. So it's, as I'd like to point out that you can actually use most of the stuff from your previous pipeline uh, as it is. And when you connect it with, with your uh, another WebSocket uh, endpoint, then it will continuously connect it to the live stream, uh, live Twitter stream, and doing some query on it and uh, returning some result from it. So, in in these two examples, we have seen that okay, how we can modularly build our our stream processing pipeline with with source, sync, and and channels and how we can combine them uh, in, a, in a different context. So initially we use the log channel, uh, sorry, the log sync, and then we, we can use the same thing to connect it to a WebSocket endpoint. Uh, plus we can use this to also uh, connect it to a different kind of stream that has a callback kind of API. So that gets us to the, to the last uh, section of this presentation. Uh, where we'll be discussing about how you can merge different streams. So, so far, what we did, we had one uh, stream, we do some transformation on those stream, and we're writing to a sync. But what if you, would, you have two different uh, streams that you'd like to join together or merge together? So there are interesting constructs in Scala stream to do that. The first one uh, is T. But in order to uh, go through the example, what we'll be doing, we'll be adding another channel uh, in the example, which will add some delay while emitting values from the stream. So the random delay function there uh, takes, a, takes a max uh, delay as input parameter, and it's create a channel, which just arbitrarily adds some delays. So if we take a look at the previous example we had, integer stream, we're passing it through this random delay channel, so it will emit values in every three seconds. Then we define also a normal, uh, normal uh, a finite stream with ABC, just for the example, and pass it through a random delay channel, but with less delay, one second delay. So let's get to T. T is a deterministic, uh, really deterministic, so when you're merging it, it's actually look at the left uh, of the stream, if you're two stream, and also look at the right stream. So it's image value from the left and right, and then left and the right. So it's actually deterministic in nature. Um, given the two stream that we had in the diagram, uh, when you use T to merge them together, it actually emits value one, then it's value A from the, sub, uh, from the, from the second stream, then it, it's wait for the, again, for the, from the left side to produce any value. But in the meantime, you see that there's a value in the second uh, stream uh, available already, but it's still waiting for the value two to be produced or emitted. So that's how it's, it's actually looking in the left first, then right, then left, then right. And depending on your strategy, it's actually combining those uh, streams together. But you can use a different strategy as well. Like uh, here we're using pass R, which actually only look into the right, right side of, of the stream and pass those value or emit those value. Uh, therefore you see ABC there when you run it. But the, the idea is still the same. It's actually look in the left side, then right, then left, then right, and wait for uh, the value to be emitted when it's looking at the other side. So it's also a kind of a process. So you can use this process of abstraction to build a different kind of stuff. That's pretty cool. Y is another uh, structure which is actually similar to T, but it is non-deterministic. So it can take a look. It can. It, the idea is that you, you have multiple. Uh, you have two streams. You run those two streams together, and uh, as soon as uh, the value is emitted, you will start emitting those values. Uh, so it can be left value or right value or both value, and depending on your margin uh, strategy, you would, you see which value to be emitted uh, from the merge. So it's a bit uh, non-deterministic in that manner. If you run it multiple times, it will just run concurrently different values and uh, produce the result. So this is also a process. So the process is kind of an abstraction that you can use to build a lot of things in the stream processing pipeline. The last combinator that I would like to discuss is margin. So, so far we had two stream, one stream, but now you have a stream of stream. So if you have stream of stream, you can run them concurrently with margin. And the idea is that uh, 
uh, it will actually e e evaluate those strings concurrently and produce uh, output those values uh, as a single stream. So basically, it will flatten the uh, flatten flatten the whole stream of stream thing to one. Uh, we have a simple example which actually uh, process uh, our processes. If you uh, use the margin, then it will it will merge it together the uh, the, the inner processes, and then uh, it will actually uh, output that thing. So yeah, we are almost at the end of the presentation. We have seen that using using uh, this process algebra and process abstraction, you can build individual component of the stream processing pipeline. Um, it's purely functional, uh, and uh, so that so it, it's immutable and referentially transparent, and it's quite easy to reason about. You can actually compose them together, move them around. It's completely type step, so you don't have to think about it much. The new version is functional stream for Scala. Uh, it will have a new uh, algebra and uh, the d dependency on, on task it, it, that's no longer there. So it's no longer dependent on Scala Z. It has own implementation of task and the focus is on performance. So I hope uh, with the new version it will be much more interesting uh, with regards to compositionality. So we have only scratched the surface of Scala Z stream in this presentation. And uh, I hope with the FS2, it will be much more interesting to work with this stream processing framework. And if you're interested, please have a look at the library. It's really lightweight. It is built around one core concept called process. So that's basically it. If you have any question, um, yeah. <laughs>